Good day, Grade Elements. Welcome to this next maths lesson. Um, I hope you've had a great week so far and that today is Wednesday. We're halfway through and that you're having a great week for the rest of the week as well. Before we start the analytical geometry, well, when I say start, we're carrying on with it. Before we carry on with the analytical, analytical geometry, I really want to talk to you about how to enroll in the grade 11 maths class. So let's quickly have a look at how you would go about doing that. Firstly, what you need to do is you need to find an internet um, browser, either Google Chrome or Firefox or Edge. And what you need to do is type in www.toenable.org. Okay. If you type that in, you'll come to this landing page. And when you do that, if you're a first time user, which I'm assuming you'll be, you can register. So you would type in your first name here, your last name, your email and register. If you've been here before, then you'll be able to log in with your email and password. And then you go to a page that looks like this, except yours won't quite be so full. You will have choose subject, you'll have progress and results, and you'll have the to enable help online. And then what you need to do is press the red button and then you go to, to choose a subject and you go to a whole list of subjects, okay? And then what you need to do is find your mathematics grade 11, it's not that difficult, and click on it and press enroll. And you'll be kicked back to this page and then you'll have a new blue button which says mathematics grade 11 to show you that you've enrolled. Right now, what you can do once you've done that is you can access live assessments. So what that means is that what I would like to do is run some live assessments. That means that I will put the questions up on an assessment and you guys can then do them. And then after a couple of days, you, we can see how you guys did. And let's say, for example, at the moment we're doing analytical geometry at the end of the section, I'll put a live assessment up on analytical geometry. And from that, I will be able to get a graph of how you guys did. So I don't get individual results. I don't know that um, Peter in Porfido got really bad marks or whatever, or got 100%. I don't know. All I know is that the graph shows me how many people got different questions right or wrong. And from that, I could be able to say, okay, fine. Obviously, you guys did awesome in this section, but you don't really understand this sec a different section. And then I can do a lesson on the section you don't understand. So that's why we want to do the live assessments. Right, so then in order to view a live session, you need to click on the upcoming events little words here. So if you click on that, you will get a screen that looks like this. And obviously it depends on how many classes you've registered for as to how many upcoming events you'll see. You need to click on the white button at the end that says view event and you'll come up with this pop up. And then you need to obviously click on the big blue button that says open live TV link. Okay, so you click on that and you come to this screen and it gives you the option to open the feed in new tab and I would do it because it makes the screen slightly bigger, which is always nicer. But more importantly, you need to press the big green button that says join the event, not sign in as event team member, that's me. You need to join the event and when you do that, you get to watch the video. Now. Before we carry on, I just want to say that if, for example, you've got sport on or you can't get to an internet connection when you when the lesson is actually on, then you're welcome to watch a recording later. OK, but the cool thing about watching it live is that there is this message studio button and that is another reason why I would like you to become a member or enroll into the class because if you do that then you can message me and you can say Candice um great awesome I don't have any problems with analytical geometry but I really don't understand stats Please, can you go through some stats, specifically this and this and this. And then what I will do is I will organize and once I'm finished the analytical geometry section, because that was a request beforehand, then I will go through that section and I will teach it, okay? Or if you guys have got specific exam questions that you guys want to go through, then that's cool too. Okay, please note that this message studio link doesn't work 
if you're watching a recording. It only works during the live session, and that's why I said it is actually better to watch the live session. But let's carry on. So let's move on with analytical geometry. Last lesson, we were talking about per parallel lines and perpendicular lines. And we said that a parallel line, the gradients were the same, that M1 equaled M2 for parallel lines, parallel lines. What you guys need to know, and this is remember revision, you guys should know this already, is that with perpendicular lines, that means that they are 90 degrees to each other. Um, the gradients are inverses of each negative inverses of each other. Okay, the gradients are negative inverses. In other words, M1 is equal to minus 1 over M2. Or another way you can think of it is that the product of them, M1 times M2 is equal to minus 1. So if the gradient of this Let's make this one quick. This gradient, let's make it easy, is 3 over 4. Then this gradient, this one here, the easy way to work it out is going to be, you just flip them and put a minus sign in between it. So it's going to be M, let's call this M1. Then M2 would be minus 1 over M1, right? So do you agree that's the same as minus 1 divided by M1? Okay, because you're dividing. So it's going to be minus 1 divided by 3 over 4. Admittedly, I'm writing this very slowly just to make sure you guys understand. So what do we do? When we divide, we tip and times. So it becomes minus 1 times 4 over 3, which becomes minus 4 over 3. There you go. Or you can just flip it and put a minus sign in front of it. Okay, understand. Right, let's move on. So now let's talk about the distance formula. So again, we're just doing revision. I'm making sure you guys know this because I do find that some of my grade 11s um, will move on to grade 11 analytical geometry and they won't remember the grade 10 stuff or the grade 9 stuff and then it's impossible. So let's just get everything on board, make sure you guys know it and then we can move on. So the distance formula is this x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus y1 squared and it's on your formula sheet so you don't have to memorize it okay you just have to know how to use it and recognize it know that that is the distance formula or the length same thing length so if they're asking you for the length of the line you use this formula as well so an example would be what is the distance between the points A minus 3 minus 1 and B, 5, 2? Okay, so let's just write that out. The distance formula is equal to the square root of x2 minus x1 all squared plus y2 minus 1 all squared. And it doesn't matter if you write y2 minus y1 squared plus x2 minus x1 squared. It doesn't matter. What does matter is that you don't mess this up. In other words, this is x1 and this is y1. And this is x2 and this is y2. So many of my students make silly, silly, silly mistakes because what they do is they mix them up. They use x1 with, um, when you use x1 with y2 and vice versa. So let's go through it. So this would be, and again, it doesn't matter if we choose a to be one and or b to be two or vice versa. So it really doesn't matter. And why does it matter? Because of the square. Okay? Because if the thing inside the bracket is positive, when it's squared, it stays positive. And if it's negative inside the bracket, then it becomes positive again. So it really doesn't matter which order you do this in. Okay? And I think I'll actually just prove it to you and just for this example, just to make sure that you guys do actually believe me. So let's do this. X2 is going to be 5 minus minus 3. And that's another source of error. Guys, if you've got negatives in your in one of your points, then always, always put a bracket around it because I find so many students forget to put that minus in and then they forget to multiply it out. So then they end up with the correct incorrect answer squared plus y2 is 2 minus minus 1. So what I was saying about students getting it wrong is that they then go minus 1 minus 2 and then that would be wrong. Okay, in other words they swap in the x's and y's. So if we work this out that becomes 5 and I'm doing it slowly 5 a minus times a minus is a plus 
3 all squared plus 2 minus sums and minuses of plus 1 all squared. So it becomes the square root of 5 plus 3 is 8 squared. 2 plus 1 is 3 squared. And that is 64 plus 9. So that's going to be the square root of 73. Okay, and I'm not going to worry about this going, finding out what the distance is in uh, actual units, because what I really want to show you now is, I mean, as in decimals, what I really want to do is show you now what would happen if we swap them. If we called this x2, y2, and this x1, y1, just to prove to you that it doesn't matter which way you do it. Okay, so d is equal to the square root of x2, okay, let's just, okay, x2, so it's going to be x2, so it's minus 3 minus 5, all squared, plus y2, which is minus 1 minus 2, all squared. Okay, admittedly, it is easier to have the negatives in front because then we don't have a double bracket. So minus 3 minus 5 is minus 8, all squared, plus minus 1 minus 2 is minus 3, all squared. So then we need to square it, and minus 8 squared is 64, plus 3 squared is minus 3 squared is 9, which is the square root of 73. Ta-da! So there you can see that it really doesn't matter which way we go. Okay. Now, more interesting question says, what is x if the length of the line is 2 root 2? So the length of the line is 2 root 2, and they want to know what x is. So let's write down a formula. We're saying d equals the square root of x2 minus x1 all squared plus y2 minus y1 all squared. And remember what I said to you guys? I said, always write down your formula, okay? Why? Because it shows you guys, it shows a teacher what you're substituting into. Because you might make a silly mistake and get all the numbers wrong, and you can't get any type of mark, or the teacher has no idea what you, where you're going with it. But if you write down the formula and then show you're working, the teacher at least knows where you've started, okay? And you can move from there. Okay, now. And obviously, at the moment, it's really obvious where you're going with this because you're using the length formula. But when you get to slightly more complicated questions where there are two or three ways of doing a question, it is always a good idea to show your teacher where you're starting. So let's call this x1 again. So we're going to call this x1, y1, and then we might as well call x, x2, and then y2. Okay, so we have got x2, which is x minus minus 1, all squared, plus y2 is 1 minus 3, all squared, and that is equal to 2 root 2. Okay, so then do you agree I can go 2 root 2 is equal to, and then I've got the square root, and this becomes x minus times and minus is a plus 1 all squared, plus 1 minus 3 is minus 2 all squared. So now my problem is that I've got a square root sign on both of these, which doesn't really work for me. So I'm going to square both sides. So what I'm going to do to get rid of the square root sign on this side is I'm going to square it. But what you do to the one side, you have to do to the other uh, side. So this becomes 4 times by 2, okay? 2 squared is 4, and root 2 times root 2 is 2, equals, if you disagree with that, you can think of it this way, it's 2 multiplied 2 to the half, because this is the exponent, is 2 to the half. So then you could add the exponents, because it's got a common base, it's 2 to the 3 over 2, and then you're squaring it, so that cancels with that, and you end with 2 cubed, which is 8, which is what I end up with here. So that just proves to you mathematically, which I've just done, which is I've squared the 2 to give you a 4, and I've squared the root 2 to give you 2. Now, square rooting this just cancels the square root sign, which is awesome. So you end up with x plus 1 squared plus 4. Okay. 
So do you agree then we've got eight is equal to X plus one squared plus four. So we're gonna hopefully end up with a trinomial. Um, hang on a minute, I could do it another way. Okay, there are two ways to do this. Okay, so I'm gonna show you both ways. The first, again, the first way to do this is to solve. So we're gonna, for the bracket first, so we're gonna take this four and we're gonna take it to the other side. So we're gonna go eight minus four is equal to X plus one squared. So therefore, 4 is equal to x plus 1 squared. Now, I'm going to show you this method, but I hesitate because a lot of students make the mistake of losing an answer. We're now going to square root again, okay? But when you square root something, you have to remember that it's plus or minus, okay? Therefore, we've got plus 4 is equal to x plus 1 or minus four is equal to x plus one. When we're squaring this, square rooting this, we actually need to accommodate for that as well. Therefore, what x is gonna equal to, when we take the cross becomes three, or x is gonna equal to four, and we take that across, it becomes minus five. So your two possible answers are three and minus five. And actually that's fine because if you think about this, and I'll show you the other way of doing it in a second. If you think about this, here is point P. Point P is at X equals minus one, Y equals three. So it's round about there. That is point P. Q is at value X, Y, one. Okay, Y is one. And you want some random X value, X is one. X is one. So basically, and they say the distance between them is two root two. So what you've got is actually a circle going around. This is supposed to be a circle. A circle going around point P, which has got a radius of two root two. So do you agree there's going to be exactly three places, two places where the radius is going to cut this y value of y equals one, and it happens to be at x equals three and x equals minus five. And I know that my drawing isn't perfect, that's why this looks like this. So let me draw it a bit bigger, maybe I should just explain it again. Here we go. Okay, x equals minus one, three. So you've got minus one and you've got one, two, three. That is p, right? Your radius is two root two, which is, what is two root two? Let's get out a calculator. So 2 root 2, 2 root 2 equals, oh that helps, is 2.8, 2.3, let's make it 3, approximately 3. So your radius is approximately 3, so it is going to do something, just short of that actually, so it's going to do something along the lines of that, okay? Horrible circle and but you get the gist. Now, this line, x equals one, x is, we don't know what x value is, but the y value is one, which means that somewhere along this line here, let me change color, somewhere along this line here, the y equals one line, we're gonna get q. So q is either gonna be at this point here or at that point there, which means, and we've proven it, we've said that x equals three or x equals minus five. So we should actually have two values of X. Okay, now, after explaining that to you, I did say to you that there are two ways to work out from this point here. So I'm just going to erase my little drawing, big drawing, and show you how to work it out from that point of view, point, okay? And the reason I'm showing you this is because, like I said, I hesitate to show you this method of square rooting because most of my students will square root, but then what they'll do is they'll forget about the minus one. So you only end up with this answer here. They only end up with x equals three answer, and that's wrong, you need both. Okay, so let me show you what you could do. You could say, okay, fine. You have got zero is equal to x plus one squared plus four minus eight. In other words, I'm bringing the eight across this way instead of going that way. So you end up with zero is equal to x plus one squared minus four. And then what I would do is I would multiply this out and get a trinomial. So I get x squared plus two x 
plus 1 minus 4 is going to be x squared plus 2x minus 3 and you end up with factorizing and you'll end up with where these answers. So the options are to do it that way. I am very, very happy. I'm just going to raise this because I don't want to confuse you. I'm very, very happy with you guys actually doing it using this method here. As long as you remember that when you square root, you're getting a plus and a minus. So you have to remember that you get two options. Okay, let's move on. So now we're going to talk about the midpoint formula. So the midpoint formula is really very easy because all we're doing is finding the average of both the x values and the y values. So it says find the coordinates of the midpoint between the two points S35 and T6-3. Seriously, this is very easy. You've got the midpoint is x1 plus x2 over 2, y1 plus y2 over 2. And remember that this formula is on your formula sheet again. So no need to memorize it. You just need to be able to recognize it. And again, it doesn't matter whether we call this x1 and x and y1 and this x2, y2. It really doesn't matter. So fun, for fun, actually, let's call this x2, y2 and call this x1, y1. OK, so in that case, if I'm substituting into this, I'm getting 6 plus 3 over 2. Oh, hang on a minute. Hang on a minute. Such a mess. Let's try again. OK, so, so you've got 6 plus 3 over 2, semicolon. And then we've got minus 3 plus 5 over 2. Please be careful and don't forget about the minus numbers, okay? So that becomes 6 plus 3 is 9 over 2, minus 3 plus 5 is 2, 2 divided by 2 is 1. There you go. And that is the midpoint. Pretty easy here. A slightly more complicated question is when they tell you this. They say m, which is a 0.32, is the midpoint between these two values. What are a and b? So what they're saying is that this is, this time we're going to call this x1, y1, and this is x2, y2, and they gave us the midpoint. So we know the midpoint can be given by x1 plus y1, mm, let's try again, shame. plus x2 over 2, y1 plus y2 over 2, right? But this is equal to 3, and this dude here is equal to 2. So we could actually work this out. We could say, well, we've got 3 plus a over 2 has to equal to 3. So then all we're doing is solving for a. So we go, well, let's multiply both sides by 2. So if we do that, we've got 3 plus a is equal to 6. Then we subtract 3 from both sides and we get a is 3. Okay, now we need to find the y value. So we go, okay, fine, that's pretty easy again. We've got minus 2 plus b over 2 is equal to 2. Again, we're going to multiply both sides by 2 to get rid of this 2. So we end up with minus 2 plus b is equal to 4. We take that across, it becomes a plus, so it equals 4 plus 2, which is 6. So my point r is 3, 6. There you go. You could have also done it this way. You could have said, well, we've got this line, which is, we've got this point, which is 3 minus 2. So we've got x equals 3 and y... Oh, 3, k okay, wait, 1, 2, 3, and y equals minus 2, 1, 2. So that's q. Okay, we have the midpoint at x equals 3, which is going to be there, and then 1, 2. So do you see it is pretty obvious that that is how many units long? That is obviously 1, 2, 3, 4 units long. So you just need to go 4 units up, okay, which is what we did there, which is 6. Okay, but obviously this is not always the case. It's not always that they're nice that they give you that the midpoint is on the same vertical line, etc. Right, let's talk colinear points. Uh, 
So the definition of collinear points is that collinear points are on the same line. Okay. So if you've got three points, A, B, and C, the gradient between A and B will be the same as the gradient between B and C. Okay. Think about it. If you've got three points, and I, I say to you that the gradient, oopsie, that's not good. That's not good. Okay. The gradient between, oh dear, oh dear. Okay, hang on a minute. Don't worry. It'll come back. I'll fix it again. I have no idea why I did that. Don't worry about that. Slideshow. Where were we? Let's go down. We were. No, no. Oh, it didn't keep my writing. Never mind. Okay. Well, yeah, we were. Yeah. From current side. Okay. So if you think about it, we've got three points. We've got A and B. Okay. And then we've got C. Okay. And if I tell you the gradient of AB has to equal the gradient from B to C, then obviously this has to be the same line because B is on both these lines. Okay. So that's how we prove it. So they love asking this, even in grade 12, they love asking, show the points that these points are collinear. Why do they like asking you? Because basically by asking you to show the points are collinear, they're actually asking you to prove that you know the definition of collinear points. So we are saying that the gradients are the same. So what we need to do is work out the gradient. It really doesn't matter. You could work out AB and then you could work out AC or you could work out BC. But the point is that all three of these have to be the same. It doesn't matter. So why don't we, since we said by definition that it was AB and BC, we'll just work out AB and BC. Okay, so we're gonna work out the gradient of AB and the gradient of BC and see if they're the same. So the gradient of AB is going to remember B y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. It's always rise over run. Okay, so we're going to call this again. It makes no difference. So why don't we call this x2 and this y2 and this x1 and y1 just for this example. So then y2 is going to be minus 3 minus y1, which is 3 all over x2, which is 22 minus x1, which is 4. So that's going to be minus 6 over 22 minus 4 is 18. So 6 goes both into 6 and 18 three times. So it goes minus 1 over 3. Okay, and now we said we were going to do BC, hey? We said BC. So now we're going to do these two. So let's call this again X1 and Y1. And why don't we just call this X2 and Y2. So therefore M of BC is going to be, and also guys, it shouldn't make a difference whether you go BC or CB. Hey? It really doesn't make a difference if it's all in the same straight line. So it's going to be uh, Y2, which is 6 minus Y1, which is 3 over x2, which is minus 5 minus 4, okay? 6 minus 3 is 3, over minus 5 minus 4 is minus 9. Woohoo, it's looking good. Divide both the top and the bottom by 3, we get minus a third. Ta-da! So therefore, we've proven that these three points are collinear because they've got the same gradient. Now, a more interesting question, when the one that you're more likely to get in the exams, is proving that these are collinear. So we're saying these three points are collinear, what is X? So let's call this point A, this point B, and this point C. Then what we're going to do is we're going to do exactly the same. We're going to get M of AB has to equal M of BC. Do you agree with that? Okay, so we're going to call this, we're going to say, okay, fine, this is x1, y1, this is x2, y2, for MAB. Okay, so let's do that. So we're going to go MAB is equal to y2, which is minus 2, minus y1, which is 8, over x2, which is 1, minus x1, which is minus 1 which is minus 10 over 1 
minus times minus is a plus, so it's 1 plus 1, which is 2, which is minus 5. So the gradient is minus 5, and that has to equal the gradient of BC. So again, I'm just going to change color so you can see what I'm doing. Uh, let's go purple. I'm now going to look at BC, and since this was x2, y2, I'm just going to leave it as x2, y2, but this time I'm going to call this x1 and this y1. Okay, so now we're getting the gradient of BC. So that is going to be y2, which is minus 2, minus y1, over x2, which is 1, minus x. Okay, so that's what we've got. But now we know what this gradient is, it's minus 5. So we can go, no, but minus 5 is equal to minus 2 minus 1 is minus 3 over 1 minus x. So do you agree that I can cross multiply? I can multiply this by, okay, another way to do it slowly is to get rid of this as a denominator. So we can multiply this side by 1 minus x. What we do to the one side, we always have to do to the other side. So this becomes minus 5 is equal to minus 3, sorry, minus 5 times by 1 minus x is equal to minus 3. I can then divide both sides by minus 5 to get rid of it over there. So then we've got 1 minus x is equal to 3 over 5. Then to get rid of this, I'm going to subtract both sides, 1 from both sides. So I get minus x is equal to 3 over 5 minus 1. So therefore, minus x is going to be minus 2 over 5, and then we just cancel and you get x equals 2 over 5. You guys, you could have just cross-multiplied over here. That's fine. There are lots of other ways. You could have multiplied the 5 through and then subtracted and then divided. That's fine too. Okay, the point is that you get the final answer out where x equals 2 over 5. So for these three points to be collinear, x has to equal 2 over 5. Okay. Now we're going to talk about equations of lines, and we're starting to get to slightly more complicated and more nitty-gritty stuff. So in order to get the equation of a straight line, there are a couple ways you can do it. You can use a two-point form, you can use a gradient intercept form, etc., etc. So we're going to go through the different ways. The reason being that usually you guys, I know for a fact you guys t tend to find a way that you like, and you tend to stick to it, and that's cool too, but sometimes it's not possible and you need to actually use one of the options that you know of, that we've taught you, okay, something that you're not usually used to using. And I'll explain now. So the two-point formula is this. We're going y minus y1 over x minus x1 is equal to y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So this is the general one, okay, and this is when we have the two points, okay, so we're going y minus y1 over x minus x1 is equal to y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, so that there is a two-point formula, and a lot of students I find find this very useful, and they use it all the time, I just find it a bit irritating, um, if you're given two points, and obviously this is one of the easiest and quickest ways to get the answer out, okay, but there are other methods and you can use either any of them unless the example in the exam or the question in the exam asks you to use a two-point formula, in which case you have to use it. So, an example of this would be finding the equation of a straight line through the points 5, 4, and minus 1, minus 5. Okay, and I will show you the other ways to do it using the intercept and a gradient method as well, but let's use the two-point method, okay? So I'm going to call this x1, y1, and I'm going to call this x2, y2, okay? So in that case, do you agree that we've got y minus y1, which is 4, over x minus 5, is equal to minus 5 minus 4 over minus 1 minus 5, x2 minus x1. And now all we're going to do is solve for y and x. We're going to get them in the right order. Okay, so what we end up with is y minus 4 
over x minus 5. Minus 5 minus 4 is minus 9. Minus 1 minus 5 is minus 6. So those cancel. And you end up with y minus 4 is equal to, if we divide both of these by 3, you get 3 over 2 x minus 5. So now we're almost there. Remember the equation for straight line is y is equal to mx plus c, where m is your gradient and c is your y cut or your intercept. So we need to get it into that format. And you can see that we're almost there. We just have to solve now for our y and we need to multiply out this bracket. So let's first multiply out the bracket. You get y minus 5 is equal to 3 over 2x minus 5 times 3 over 2. So therefore we've got y is equal to 3 over 2x minus, that becomes 15 over 2 plus 5. So do you get 15 over 2, 5 can be written as 10 over 2, okay? We can use a common denominator of 2. So let me just write that out. It becomes 3 over 2x minus a common denominator of 2 is 15 plus 10, okay? Because there's an implied one here. 1 goes into 2 twice, 2 times 5 is 10. Now I'm just going to write it up here. Guys, please don't do this. Just keep writing underneath. If you run out of space, turn over the page. Okay, don't write next to it. Teachers don't want to have to look for your answers, so please don't do it. So it's 3 over 2x minus 15 plus 10 is what? Okay, 15 plus 10 is what? 15 plus 10 is... Sorry, I was just taking my maths was right. 25 over 2. And you can leave it like that, or you can write it as 1.5x minus 12.5. And, and there you go. Right, now, again, we're going to use this same equation to find the straight line through the points minus 4 naught and 3, 6. Okay, I'm doing it a second time for the simple reason that I find, like I said, a lot of my students struggle with this for some reason. So let's go through it nice and slowly and make sure you know. And this time I'm going to call this x2 and y2. And then I'm going to call the next point x1, y1. Okay. So again, we're saying y minus, in this case, it's 3 over x minus. Oh, sorry, guys. Let's try again. It's 6 y minus 6 over x minus 3 is equal to y2, which is 0 minus y1, which is 6, over x2, which is minus 4, minus 3. Okay? So remember, again, we're getting the formula y is equal to mx plus c. We need it in that format. So you go y minus 6 is equal to x minus 3 multiplied whatever this is. So this becomes minus 6 over minus 4 minus 3 is minus 7. Let me just check that that's right. It's minus 4 minus 3. Yes, that's right. So then you've got, you need to multiply this. Okay, minus and minus cancel. So you had y minus 6 is equal to 6 over 7x minus 3 times 6 is 18 over 7. Now we need to add the 6 onto the other side. So you get y is equal to 6 over 7x minus 18 over 7 plus 6. But do you agree we could actually change 6 to be a fraction over 7? We could say, well, that's the same as minus, that's 7 and that's 18. Remember that's implied 1. 1 goes into 7 how many times it goes? 7. 7 times 6 is 42. So then if you've got 6 over 7x minus 2 and an 8 becomes a 0, 4 and a 1 is a 5, so it becomes 60 over 7. And you're quite, I'm quite happy for you to leave your answer like that. Okay, now you can get the gradient point form. The gradient point form is, uses this equation. We say that y minus y1 over x minus x1 is equal to m. We again, y and x are the general numbers in your equation. So in other words, you're given 
and it rearranges, sorry, it rearranges to y minus y1 is equal to m times x bar minus x1. And it doesn't matter which form you remember as long as you're using it if they ask you to use the gradient point form. Okay. So again, it says determine the equation of a straight line passing through the point 3 minus 2 with the gradient of minus a half. So we're going to obviously let this be x1 and this be y1 because there aren't any options. So we'd go y minus y1, which is minus 2. And again, you need to be so careful not to remember to include the minus, I mean the brackets, is equal to minus a half x minus 3. Okay, so you get y plus 2, minus times minus is a plus, is equal to, when we multiply this becomes minus a half x, and minus times a plus, minus is a plus, 3 over 2. To solve for y, what do we need to do? We need to take 2 across, it becomes y is equal to minus a half x, plus 3 over 2, minus 2, ach, 3 over 2. 3 over 2, sorry, 3 over 2, so that becomes minus a half x plus, do you agree that's the same as saying 3 minus 4, because there's a common denominator, I mean there's a, an implied 1 here, so you go 1 into 2 is 2, 2 times 2 is 4, and all I've done is brought these two numbers over a common denominator, so it becomes minus a half x minus a half. There you go. And that is the equation of this. Okay, grade 11s. I think that's enough for today. We will carry on with doing the gradient intercept form of the equation of the line and then we'll move on to more complicated analytical geometry in the next lesson, which is on Monday. Have a great day.